Testing. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah, I'm trying to hold it away. We are starting in approximately 30 seconds. is Anawa Miller. I am a tribal you to welcome you this morning. We are excited to gather under the theme of healing and but there is a story behind it to share it on I ordered the well, I really wanted it. Wouldn't get on. Test. 
testing. Okay. Wouldn't get here in time. So there is a story behind this dress. Um, ordered them in blue, the blue would have gotten here. So before I was leaving the conference, I met someone, a relative from, from my tribe actually. And she said, are you texting me? She said, are you still here? And I said, yes. And she said, well, the lady that we were talking to left something for you. And I was like, okay. So, and this young lady was on her way out and we caught each other the last five minutes before she left. Well, the lady who I complimented left me the dress and a bag of saltwater taffy along with it. And she left the message also that she wanted me to walk in that same power that she felt when she wore the dress. And so it is with this spirit that we come to you today. We offer you our best. We offer you what is in our baskets. And we are here to intently listen to your needs and respond out of that same connection, that healing through connection to empower us, to strengthen us as we do our work in Indian country. And so again, this is healing through connection. Um, my, my letter in the agenda booklet expresses that as well in words, in black and white, but I wanna stand here before us today and again, usher in that same spirit of healing through connection. We are here to support. We are here to provide um, resources for you. And again, just to connect. We're all over the region, but we want to move forward in this conference, move forward in our USET work along that same vein with that same mindset and beyond the mindset, the same heart set. So we are here to serve we are here to listen and we are here to connect during this week. And so at this time, I would like to yield to any elder or tribal leader that would be interested in offering prayer this morning as we continue to open up. If there are none, I, I am prepared to move forward in that, but I do yield to any elder or tribal leader that would like to offer prayer. I will actually come down. I don't want to do it from a uplifted position. So if we could just take a moment to center on prayer. Creator, we come to you. We invite you into this space. We acknowledge you for the power that resides in each and every one of us, for the charge that you've given us in the healing process of our land, of our people, of one another. We ask that your, your, the spirit, spirit come in and dwell with us, lead us, guide us, guard us, during this time. We thank you for the ancestors that gather with us. We thank you for those that are present that we gather here safely. We ask it again that we just go into this meeting to heal through connection that we have here. We thank you for the opportunity to gain in wisdom, to share wisdom and to grow and to go out and serve and just dwell here among us. Woods, thank you. And I yield to Ms. Bernice for the next introduction. So good morning, everyone. To kick off USET's best practices session, we have Holly Echo Hawk presenting on Native Brilliance. I would like to introduce you to my friend, Holly. She is a former tribal and mainstream behavioral health director with more than 35 years of experience in the administration and development of licensed and accredited mental health and substance abuse treatment services. An author of Tribal Best Practices, Ms. Echo Hawk has substantial experience consulting with tribal health programs across Indian country. 
She also works internationally and is a member of the Rarata Group, mm -hmm. a coalition of indigenous behavioral health experts from New Zealand, Australia, Canada, and the US. Ms. Echo Hawk currently serves as a behavioral health subject matter expert with the National Opioid Response Network, the New England Mental Health Technology Transfer Network, and C4 Innovations. She is also employed as a tribal behavioral health subject matter expert with Kaufman and Associates and serves as the senior advisor for the California Tribal MAT for opioid treatment and stimulant use for California tribal and urban Indian health clinics. She attended the University of Oklahoma, the University of Texas at Austin, and the California School of Professional Psychology. She earned a Master's of Science in Organizational Behavior with a School of Psychology. Holly Echohawk is an enrolled member of the Pawnee Nation of Oklahoma. Thank you so much for being here, Holly. The floor is yours. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for inviting me today. I'm super happy to be here. Anytime I'm in front of uh, any of the USAT tribal nations, it's an honorable day for me. So thank you all for being here. And thank you said for that wonderful breakfast. I was managed to kind of wolf down a delicious burrito. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, I am, I'm, I'm super happy to be here with you all today. And I'm going to share a couple of things with you over the next 45 minutes or so. Hopefully you won't get tired of hearing my voice. I personally don't even like to hear myself uh, talk for more than 30 minutes, but I'll try to keep it uh, entertaining for you as well and moving, emotionally moving, I think. Um, so I'm going to do a couple of things. One is I want to uh, tell you a little bit more about myself and my background. Uh, and then I want to tell you about my belief in brilliance, native brilliance. Um, and then I want to talk about why native innate intelligence is so important and so critical right now. I'm going to show you um, some quick information about the impact of substance use on in, in Indian country. And then I'm going to share with you what our response has been to that. Um, and when I say our response, I mean uh, my partnership and the mental health, New England Mental Health Technology Transfer Center and the C4 Innovation partnered with um, USET to develop this series I'm going to tell you about. So, um, so with that, let me begin, and if we can go to the next slide. So I bring you greetings from the Pawnee Nation, Pawnee Nation of Oklahoma, and um, <clears throat> that is the great seal of the Pawnee Nation uh, on the left, of course. And on the right is a photo from uh, Pawnee Nation has a, a powwow every year, 4th of July weekend. Regardless of how hot it's been lately, it always occurs. And um, the straight answer there is very familiar to me. I actually don't know who that is, but um, the way he's dressed is the way that we were raised. Uh, my family are all straight dancers. Um, and and to watch them as, you know, all my life to watch uh, people get dressed, to put the regalia on, um, it's really very moving. And, to, and, and you all know this too, I'm sure, but to watch with how much care they take care of every feather, every, every piece of the regalia is, is sacred. And you can almost hear the, the, the bells, you know, they have different kinds of uh, sound, depending on what the bells are made of and the shape of the bells. And, but <clears throat> yeah, so I was raised uh, in the um, in the straight dance 
around the straight dancers. And I used to, as a little girl, I used to be really fascinated about the roaches, <clears throat> you know, the porcupine quills and, and the spreaders that go inside of them and, and just to watch all that. And of course, the women as well, um, and, and myself, you know, as a kid uh, growing up, we all, we all danced and there's nothing more exciting than to be in your home tribe at a dance. And we have many war dances, which are, you know, set different than powwows, but to be dancing with all my relatives and all my cousins, uh, it, there's nothing more exciting to me. So I do want to bring you greetings from the Pawnee Nation. And then the next slide. So the picture on the left is actually my grandfather. Um, you know, the alcoholic side of my family um, is a pretty uh, relatively well-known name in Indian country. Um, and when I introduce myself to people who haven't met me and I say, I'm Holly Echohawk, and then they always say, are you? And I say, yes, uh, we're all cousins. <laughs> I'm of the generation of my cousin, John Echohawk, my cousin, Larry Echohawk, my cousin, uh, Walter Echohawk, the, the NARF attorneys, uh, cousin Lucille. But now we hear a lot about our younger, our nieces and nephews, which is my niece, uh, Abigail, my niece, Lael, um, my nephew, uh, Bunky Echohawk, the artist. Um, so it's really exciting to see the third generation of our family uh, stepping up into the social justice that we believe in and that we stand for. So we're quite proud of that. But on the other side of my family, <clears throat> which is this side, the Morgan side of my family, um, I was really very fortunate and very blessed. My mother was a full blood Pawnee and my father was a Pawnee. Um, so, <clears throat> and the Echohawk side of my family uh, were land surveyors, actually. My grandfather, George Echohawk, was one of the first Indian land surveyors in the country, and he taught all his sons. My father and that whole generation were all land surveyors. They taught and turned their sons. All of my male cousins were land sur surveyors <clears throat> before they went on to other professional fields. But so we were, so the education was important, that side of that type of education, I should say, super important on that side of my family. The other side of my family, which is my grandfather, <clears throat> um, they were Native American church people. They were old time Native American church people in the state of Oklahoma. And uh, this picture of my grandfather uh, was just sent to me by my family, not you know, like around Christmas, so not very long I've had this picture. It's such a cool picture <clears throat> because, um, and when I show people this and I tell them this is my grandfather and this is the man uh, I was raised with. We were raised often in the Morgan home in Pawnee. And so after they see this picture, which is very old timey, they always say, you know, well, what year, you know, what year were you born? Like 1854? And I said, it felt like it. Uh, because when, you, when you're fortunate, and, and many of you have had this experience of being raised around, uh, being raised around old traditions, it's really, uh, it's really incredibly awesome. And, but his picture, when I go back to it, you can see that uh, this is probably um, late 1800s maybe early 1900, but his, he's holding his eagle feathers, but that's back in the day when they just really just had it torn off of the eagle. You know, now everybody has these beautiful beaded handles to eagle feathers, but back then they would just hold the feathers, you know. So you can see he's holding a clump of feathers and he's got um, uh, otter hide on his braids, which is what we still use today. And He's got that cool breastplate. And you can see he's got some kind of medallion thing on, which is that's what they used to do when they would take pictures of, of native people. They would always put something on them um, like this medallion and his breech cloth. And it's just a cool picture. I love that picture. But that was my grandfather who I was raised with in, his, uh, in their home. And then the next one click. And then one, one more. So I just show you that picture of my 
the Morgan side of my family, the Native American church people, <clears throat> uh, just to say that my childhood of being raised around POD meetings and traveling with my grandparents um, to different locations for, for these prayer meetings was really um, a silent, deep impact on me. And when we were testing the mic earlier, and they wanted me to count, and then I did a count in Spanish. When I was a little girl, my grandfather <clears throat> taught us how to uh, count in Indian. But it wasn't until we were you know, nearly adults, we realized that he taught us to count in Spanish. And the reason he did that is because they would go, the, the peyote men would go down into Texas, South Texas, to get the peyote. So they all spoke Spanish to some degree, in addition to Pawnee language. So, but I, um, you know, all of us, wherever, where we're from is kind of deep in our bones, right? So my being from Pawnee, the Pawnee Nation, I was born in Pawnee, Oklahoma. I was raised, I lived my whole entire childhood until I went to college in Pawnee, Oklahoma. I went to Pawnee schools, it was Pawnee County, everything was Pawnee. Uh, so I always say that I never, I skipped that whole opportunity to have an identity crisis because clearly <clears throat> I knew who I was. But I also went to boarding school. I went to the Shalaka Winden School, which is on the Oklahoma Kansas border. And um, my younger sister and I went and we chose to go. We weren't forced to go. We wanted to go because we wanted to go to school with just other Indian kids. And it was awesome. It was horrible. And we saw things that people should never have to see. But it was also incredibly wonderful to be with just with Indian kids from all over the country. Um, and that was the first time I met Alaska Native people. It was the first time I met Seminole people. It was the first time I met New York tribes all because of Shalaka Winden School, because the kids came from all over the country. And, and we, act, we actually loved it. We didn't love the horrible things, but we loved every day being with just Indian kids. Uh, so <clears throat> I, I do have the boarding school experiences, both positive and, and negative. Uh, but the next slide I wanna show you is just to remind you all, because I know you all are from other states where Oklahoma is in the country. And then the next slide, one more click. So there's 39 tribal nations in the state of Oklahoma. So just in that one state highlighted in red, there are 39 tribal nations there, all deep in their history and their traditions. And, and you all know this, but I tell people who are not native, um, who are native allies, often they're people who are working in health or healthcare, that you can tell what tribe somebody is by, the, by their regalia and by their beadwork design and by their ribbon work. And so that's in Oklahoma, same thing. All these tribes, 39, 39 tribal nations in one state. <laughs> of course, they weren't all there originally, they were moved down so that other that other slide uh, with the yellow <laughs> and ironically it says tornado alley which is true <laughs> i grew up around tornadoes all the time uh, and now you know what they have in oklahoma earthquakes they have earthquakes in oklahoma hundreds of earthquakes every year they never had an earthquake in my whole time my whole life of living in oklahoma but it's because of fracking, because of the damage that's done underground. So now it's not so much a threat of tornadoes, which still happen, but it's earthquakes, hundreds of earthquakes every year in Oklahoma now, which is unbelievable. But I wanted to show you the, this uh, map with the yellow, not so much because of the tornado alley, which is true, but because of the other states. <clears throat> so when I was a kid growing up in Oklahoma, we only went north and south from the state and we would go visit other tribes. We never went 
east or west. Um, so the the um, Pawnee Nation was originally in the Nebraska area, northern Nebraska. So above o Oklahoma, of course, is Kansas, and above Kansas is Nebraska. And then above that is the Dakotas. So in northern Nebraska is where the Pawnees used to be, into, and then they were moved down into Indian Territory in like 1874, 75, 76. Uh, but all those tribes still know each other. We still have relations eons back. Matter of fact, when I go up to um, North Dakota, <clears throat> uh, the tribes up there call me sister because the languages are similar because we used to all hang out together back in the days. The other thing that the Pawnees used to do is um, Pikes Peak in Colorado was a sacred spot for the Pawnees. So back in the days, and this is back when people were walking or on horses, they would go as far as Pikes Peak um, to the, the, what they considered a sacred mountain to the Pawnees, as did many other tribes. There's a funny story about uh, that my mother shared that uh, a long time, those ancient times, uh, there were other tribes up in uh, the Pikes Peak area in Colorado and this one tribe was there and then the word got out that the Pawnees were coming. And so that one tribe that was there said, you know, the Pawnees are coming, you know, hang on to your horses, watch out for your horses because the Pawnees will take your horses. So that other tribe who shall remain unnamed really took, went to bed and hung on to their horses and had their reins in their hands. And in the morning when they woke up, the horses were gone and all they had was the reins in their hands. <laughs> I don't know if that's true. I think it might be. So, uh, but anyway, I just want to share with you a little bit about uh, Oklahoma and, and the way I was raised is all the Plains Indians, we just all, we only went north and south. Uh, and mainly for uh, visitation of other tribes back in the ancient days, we still visit each other. We still have relationships with each other. Uh, tribes would come and visit in, us in Oklahoma and we would go visit them or we'd go for Native American church meetings. So the next slide is I wanna tell you a little bit about why I believe in native brilliance. I have been really fortunate, as Bernice was saying, uh, for decades, <clears throat> uh, 35 years, probably more than 35 years, I've worked in behavioral health. I started working in children's mental health. And, and I'm a former behavioral health director, both for county mental health and for uh, tribal uh, behavioral health. And I did a lot of work with SAMHSA. I did a lot of writing about best practices, native best practices. So in all of that work, I've always been really fortunate and blessed to be able to travel all over the country to visit different tribes and to have them share with me um, how they approach services for their tribal members. So whether that's in the remote areas of Alaska or the Pacific Northwest or California or the Dakotas or Utah or down in the Southwest. <clears throat> um, of course, in the middle of the country and now more recently, the past 10 years or so, uh, East Coast tribes. And everywhere I go, I see brilliance. I see the brilliance of native people, whether they're older people, elders, or whether they're teenagers that are quiet, but that brilliance is just exuding from them. I see the intelligence of Native people everywhere I go. So I've been thinking about it for several years now, and I'm thinking we need to start something about brilliance. We need to put we need to reaffirm the brilliance that Native people are born with. I always say that Native people 
are brilliant and native young people are brilliant. They're born brilliant. It's in our DNA. It's in our ancestry. We're brilliant people. It's only social injustices and racism and discrimination that tamp down that brilliance, especially on young people. So it's our job to do in the work that we do is to lift those, that weight of injustice off of our young people so that that innate brilliance they have can come into full play. So I have a complete belief in native brilliance. I see it, whether it's in art, um, whether it's in uh, the designs like of your dress, um, whether it's early astronomers of how we traveled by the stars. Um, there are so many examples of native brilliance. Um, and you can see now that, um, no surprise to us, that larger society is returning back to tribal ways because the world and the United States has gotten themselves in a terrible mess with the environment. And, um, you know, like the fires in California the past few years have been devastating, <clears throat> devastating to the tribes, some tribes. Uh, but if the U.S. government followed some tribal beliefs on forest management and uh, periodic burnings, <clears throat> all so much could be avoided. They tell me in Australia, remember a year or two ago, there was that giant fire in Australia. <clears throat> the Aboriginal people told me that that would have never happened. Same thing if Australia would have followed the ancient traditions of the Aboriginal people. So, <clears throat> so what we're doing with the concept of brilliance, and I'm going to tell you more about it as I get into this, we are intentionally reframing the image of native people. We are reclaiming brilliance and we're putting it out there. We're saying it loud, we're saying it often. And it's very much resonating um, with native people all over the country because it's true. <clears throat> so the, the next slide is, I just wanna show you about my, my, I have this personal belief in brilliance and I think you, you all probably share that, I hope. But we have to always assume native brilliance. We have to assume it's always there, regardless of what that native person may look like. I always say whatever condition their condition is in, assume brilliance. Whether it's a native person that's kind of sitting on the curb and looking kind of down and out. When I see somebody like that, I always think, I bet you that's a brilliant person. I bet you that person has a lot of life experience stories to share. I bet you they have this incredibly innate intelligence. Uh, so assume brilliance, that's the message of the day. And then I just want to share with you the USAT's definition of native brilliance, that it, native brilliance acknowledges the strengths of native people and refers to their innate intelligence, that DNA intelligence and balance resources and resilience. And that, that um, logo of the head with the stars in its brain is such a wonderful, beautiful, uh, a beautiful, I don't know if it's logos or right word, but it's just great that the USAT communications team developed that for us. So the next slide is another example of indigenous intelligence from uh, an elder in Canada, uh, Elder Jim Dumont, who's a fabulous man. But he always says, he said that First Nations elders describe indigenous intelligence as it's more than the acquisition of knowledge and more than the mental manipulation of thoughts and ideas. He said, rather it's the intelligence of, of, of it all, of the body, the mind, the heart, and the spirit. That's the innate indigenous intelligence. So the next slide is um, from the Lummi Nation, which is where I was a behavioral health director. I was hired quite a few years back now to 
be, be the first behavioral health director for Lummi Nation. Um, and you, you all probably know that it, Lummi Nation's in Washington State. It's right on the Canadian border, just very, very close to the Canadian border. <clears throat> but they called, um, they developed this concept called mental sovereignty, which I, I love. I think that is a super cool um, mental sovereignty. And they developed these racial trauma support groups for all of the people up there. But I just love this concept of mental sovereignty. I want to share that with you and also to share the picture of the paddle shirts that they have on, um, which are, you know, and the Lummi people are canoe people. And if you've ever gone seeing the canoes come in, you know, all the coastal Salish tribes are canoe people and then one tribe will host every year the others and they all come in and they sing as they, they sing them in from the shore and the uh, people in the canoes have paddles up and then they, they sing. It's really, and there's hundreds of canoes. It's quite spectacular to see. But I, I love what the Lummi Nation did in calling it mental sovereignty. So I wanna share that with you. So the next, the next slide is, so why is assumption of native intelligence important? Well, it's important for lots of reasons, but why now? Why, why am I saying it's all hands on deck time to use that native intelligence we have? So what I wanna show you in the next slide is there's some very powerful reasons why native brilliance, why innate intelligence important. And one of the reasons is um, what I call the cultural self. So for a native person, and this could be the same probably for um, a Latino person or any person of, from a deep culture, that your view of yourself as a human is grounded in culture as a native person. And the cultural self is your core. It's your, it's everything. It's unspoken often, but it is your being. And the, the, your cultural self and awareness, even if it's quiet awareness of yourself as a native person, that is your path to becoming a human being, to becoming a full human being, using all of your faculties and all of the innate intelligence you were born with. However, the cultural self and the sense of self-worth can be really fragile and it needs to be protected. So when people are pounded on by racism and discrimination and uh, you know, ridiculous sports mascots and all of the things that native people endure constantly and that the young people endure sometimes silently, but they're enduring it. Uh, the bullying, you know, all the, all the pounding that happens that can really impact the sense of your cultural self. That's what I mean by cultural self is fragile and it needs to be protected. And that's our job. That's what we do. We do everything we can to protect the cultural self and young people. Um, but the other thing about the cultural self is a, a sense, a strong sense of self. My mother used to always say, stand up to your full height. And what she meant was the strong sense of cultural self or the strong sense of self. Be confident. So your, your cultural self, your sense of being, influences your confidence as you grow and mature, your problem solving capacity, your ability to think through and make good decisions and your general life direction. Uh, but if your cultural self is damaged because it's been pounded on from all these societal injustices, it influences your ability to have confidence. It influences negatively your ability to kind of problem solve. You become more reactionary. You don't think things through. 
um, you're triggered. Um, so cultural self is incredibly important. So the next thing I wanna show you is a couple of things about substance use in Indian country. If you can go to the next slide. So the first thing, I only have three of these slides to show you because they're not very happy slides. So this first one is overdose mortality by race and ethnicity for the past 20 years. And the, the different colors are different ethnicities, but the top one is the American Indian and Alaska Native overdose mortality, death by overdose over the past 20 years. And you can see that that line for 20 years has been going up. So my mission, one of my missions, I have a bunch of missions. One of my missions in life, which I think you all share, I'm sure you do. I know your tribes do is to, with all of our collective work and using all of the brilliance that we have and the knowledge that we have is to get that line that's been going up for 20 years. And you might see that dotted line, the vertical dotted line, that's COVID. So you can see even beyond the COVID, beginning of COVID, it continued to go up even higher. So one mission in, of my life is to get that, is to see that instead of going up to see it flatten out. And then to see it go down. So you can see we have our work cut out for us. So the next slide is methamphetamine related deaths uh, for men and by race and ethnicity. So you can see the top line, the yellow line, that is American Indian and Alaska Native death from methamphetamine. The reason it's spiking even more, if you look at the, and this is just from 2011 to 2018, but the reason it's spiking up more towards the end is primarily because of fentanyl. So if we go to the next slide, this is the last of the data slides. This shows you the type of drug that is caused overdose deaths. And you can see that the top one on the, on the far right, that huge spike is not even a gradual, it's almost going straight up, right? Fentanyl. That's the biggest uh, cause of overdose death. And fentanyl is an opiate. It's a man-made opiate. It slows everything down, slows your heart down, slows your breathing down, and people inadvertently ingest it. And they, uh, especially if they're not, um, if they're not involved in opiate addiction, a little bit of fentanyl will kill you. So the next slide I want to show you is just a little visual lesson. So the other thing that tribes are very concerned about and rightfully so is people, tribal members that are using poly drugs are using stimulants and opiates combination, very scary. So fentanyl is everywhere. The drug dealers have put it in everything. So if you get anything off the street, you have no idea what's in it. So the vial, there's two vials there. One of them's labeled heroin. And the bottom of that vial, the white heroin powder, that is a lethal dose of heroin for an average size man. So if an average size man ingested that vial labeled heroin, that would be enough to kill him. Sorry to use such crass words. The vial on the right, which looks like somebody's emptied it out and there's just a few specks left. Oh no, those few specks that are in that bottle is the same equivalent amount of fentanyl that can kill an average size man, the same average size man. That's how deadly fentanyl is. So that's why it's so important for us to mobilize, you know, call to action. Uh, 
do everything we can to educate our communities, to give them resources, to provide treatment and support because it's, it's very, very dangerous out there. And you can see the spike on the earlier slide about uh, the impact of COVID uh, and the isolation and the depression and all of the things have come along with that an incredible, terrible pandemic, which obviously is not over yet, much as we hoped it would be. So the next slide, <clears throat> next slide is just a quote from um, Dr. Gabor Mate, who works out of Vancouver, British Columbia. He's a physician and he works with, um, uh, he works in the field of addiction. So he treat, he's, his office and his work is based in the uh, rough area of Vancouver, British Columbia. Uh, but he, he has incredible insight about substance use and hungry ghosts of the thousands of people that he's worked with, many of which were native. He works with a lot of First Nations people in uh, downtown Vancouver, British Columbia. And one of the things he says that I think is really important is he says that most treatment facilities focus primarily on trying to change the behavior go into treatment, stop using, in, but he says they should be focusing on healing the pain that drives those behaviors. And I think that is exactly why a lot of uh, Native people who go into treatment, especially if it's a non-Native treatment program, they, they don't last. Um, they don't, it's not a um, a permanent fix for them if, and sometimes it's not even a temporary fix for them because no one's really addressing whatever the pain is that's underneath the addiction behavior. So the next slide is, oops, this is really cool picture I wanna share with you. <clears throat> Uh, it's another brilliance example. <clears throat> it's a marketing brilliance example, I think, by the New York Indian Council. So that's New York City. <clears throat> and they superimpose these old pictures of these Native people on top of the city. And I use that slide a lot <clears throat> in making the point that wherever you are, you're on Indian land. When you walk down, in this case, New York City, don't just look at the concrete in the buildings, realize that you're on tribal, you're on native land and there's native people that have walked here before. So I just love the marketing that they did on that. I just wanted to share that with you. I think that's a super cool picture. So I wanna talk just a little bit about native treatment and recovery. So the next slide. So, <clears throat> One of my good buddies is Terry Cross, uh, the founder of the National Indian Child Welfare Association out in Portland, Oregon, which is where I live. I live out in the Portland, Oregon metro area. So Terry and I've worked together for a long time, many decades, <laughs> more than three decades. And, uh, but he had this great insight talking about trends in indigenous mental health. And he says that what's happening now in Indian country is native nations are following a decolonization agenda. They're reclaiming the legitimacy of cultural knowledge as power. Of course, they're understanding that culture is a resource for health and wellness. Um, everyone is very much working on being trauma informed meaning that trauma may have happened to us, but it certainly does not define us. And that indigenous people know how to heal. We often just need to remember our ancestors, what our ancestors knew. So I want to share that quote and those thoughts of my friend Terry with you all, because I think he is as always, you know, right on target. So the next slide is, so I've been thinking about this too, about, because we do a lot of work with tribal health clinics all around the country and especially in California and helping them develop, um, kind of ramp up their treatment services for uh, people, native people who are 
have slid into an addiction world. And I say slid into it because no one wakes up and says, that's, that's what I want to do in my life. No, they go out with some buddies, some girlfriends, they try something and then uh, they end up many, too many end up in an addiction world. But contributors to native success is not just the medical assessments that are needed, which are important, but they are based on a, on a medical model as a deficit model. They're looking, focused on problems. They're not looking at strengths. So one of the things that helps, uh, contributes to treatment success for native people is strength-based assessments in addition to others. <clears throat> um, understanding the spiritual value that that person has or maybe they have had in the past, maybe they were in their family or in their tribe, maybe they've watched over the years growing up of spiritual traditions. <clears throat> and maybe they have some current experiences, but those are recognizing that part of a native person is really important. The, the same thing with voice, uh, giving them voice and control. Um, I can't say enough how important that is. Um, people who have slid into an addiction world, they've lost control of all kinds of things, of many aspects, if not all aspects of their life. So one of the contributors to success in treatment is to give them their voice back, give them their control back. Uh, don't you know, dictate to them on what this treatment plan is. Uh, the same thing with understanding their life context. Um, a lot of treatment providers are working, mainstream treatment providers in particular, are working from an ASAM perspective and they're working from a, a model that was not developed for native people. And they may not have any idea what it's like to grow up native or to grow up in a small community, or to grow up in an inner, uh, as an urban Indian person. So understanding the, uh, the native person's life context is really important. The same, uh, along with having a really realistic plan about what kind of resources does that native person have, give, wherever they're living, whatever their circumstances are. Um, assuming strength and assuming intelligence is a part of this as well. I should have listed that. Um, yeah, then the last thing I list is um, acknowledging structural vulnerabilities, meaning um, there's a cool assessment tool on structural vulnerabilities. I had to do a post questions for a presentation that we're doing coming up on structural vulnerabilities. I have a lot of fun with those. So it's like a multiple choice test. So I said, Structural vulnerability is assessing how strong your roof on your house is, uh, option A, option B, um, determining earthquake preparedness of your barn, uh, option C, you know, a, a multiple choice test. Structural vulnerability in that assessment, it's just a one page. It's, it's really a cool tool. And the man that I learned about it from was a, uh, African male nurse and he worked at San Francisco General Hospital and he worked with homeless black men. And he had many experiences of these uh, homeless black men who would, did not want to go in the building of San Francisco General Hospital. Like, I don't want to go in that room. I don't want to go in that building because it wasn't made for them. They weren't comfortable there. So he used this structural vulnerability tool. And what it does, it assesses the basic living needs as, in addition to, it, it, it assesses or asks questions about their experience with racism. It asks questions about, are they physically safe? Do they have a place to, to sleep that's safe? Um, it asks them, or it has a way to determine if they're literate or not. Uh, are they able to, to read? 
enough that they can understand or not and other basic living needs but it, and they call it a structural vulnerability assessment but it's a pretty cool tool to use in addition to the the all the other conventional assessments that are used so those are just some ideas about um, contributors to successful treatment and then the next slide might be oh yeah this is my favorite slide from from my rosebud sioux friends <clears throat> you know the rosebud sioux tribe developed the only inpatient native methamphetamine treatment program in the country and they uh they do a lot of things including they have equine therapy and this is one of their pictures i love this picture of that horse helping out the helping to fix that car <clears throat> but i just want to share that with you but yeah rosebud does some fascinating work on um and uh of steeped in experience of working with native methamphetamine um, addiction then the next thing i want to share with you is my whole thing about my one of my personal missions i think we have about 12 minutes or so left so I told you I have a bunch of missions, <clears throat> meaning things I want to change in the world. I don't have a bunch. I have about maybe three, <clears throat> but they're big. So one of them is on, about native behavioral health and behavioral health, meaning mental health and substance use, <clears throat> emotional wellness. So one of the ideas that I promote wherever I go is this concept of leveling the playing field on who's perceived as expert. A long time ago, this is probably 30 years easily, um, Dr. Taylor McKinsey on Navajo. Dr. McKinsey is a Navajo man who was also an MD. And he gave the really cool presentation I never forgot. It was just a one slide. And he talked about it really um, built on this concept of perceived role of who the expert is. And on one side of the slide, he had a, 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 a physician, a medical doctor. On the other side, he had a traditional healer. And he said that both the, the physician and the traditional healer actually do the same thing. When they have a patient that comes to them for care, they both do conduct an assessment to determine what the needs are, what the medical needs are. They both develop a treatment plan. They do it in different ways. They both provide treatment. They do it in different ways. Navajo might be ceremonies and songs and physician. And it would be, you know, um, x-rays or medication. So they both do an assessment. They both do a, uh, develop a treatment plan. They both provide treatment. They both provide aftercare. I thought that was the most simplest and terrific way to look at leveling the playing field or the field of expert. So in my work in different parts of the country, that's my message to healthcare providers is that healthcare providers are very valuable and needed, but their training is in a medical model which is very important, but they have to realize that they, the patient sitting in front of them is probably as much an expert in different ways as they are in the medical field. And the community members are experts in their way of life in knowing what the resources are of knowing um, and tremendous knowledge. So, so the healthcare professionals that are not native 
I try to help them understand that they are an important part, but they are only a part. And there's equal experts in the community that have different kinds of knowledge, but as valuable as the knowledge that they bring. And that will get a lot further if, if we all proceed like Dr. Taylor McKenzie suggested in how all these different uh, areas of expertise are so critically important and they have to work together. The other thing, the message that I give is that culture is not an add-on. It's not that you take a standard practice, conventional non-native practice and then say, oh yeah, wait a minute, what about culture? Let's add that over here. No. My friends in North Dakota often say, culture's the center, culture's the core. The community context, the culture is everything. That's where you start. The medical services and supports are the add-on, not the other way around. So the third thing is about trauma. So <clears throat> I have this whole other thing I do, which I'm not gonna do now, but I'll just share the point is I, I know trauma exists. I've seen trauma, we've all experienced trauma. Sometimes trauma just by grief and loss, unresolved grief and loss. I understand all of that, we've all experienced it. But what I see often that doesn't get talked about enough is not post-traumatic stress, but it's the opposite, post-traumatic growth. It's, it's the strengthening, it's the great things that come out of trauma exposure. Just because you've experienced trauma does not mean that you will 100% be traumatized. So, but I do know that, and you all see this, I'm sure in your uh, areas of your work, that trauma does, unresolved trauma, does create emotional pain that needs to be addressed. And unresolved emotional pain is a very common underpinning of addiction behavior. So it goes back to the Dr. Matei's uh, quote that I shared with you at the beginning, is that we have to, we can't just try to get someone to change their behavior, stop using X. We have to figure out ways to help them think about and to trigger that innate intelligence they have to think about whatever that emotional unresolved pain is that leads them down a path of reacting instead of thinking through, uh, making poor choices without thinking of consequences. Um, all of those often kind of get stuck in unresolved trauma. So what I wanna share with you next is a couple of things that we have to remember. If you're a healthcare provider or in your community of healthcare providers, the healthcare providers have to always remember that for native people, that cultural and social context of their community, like me in Pawnee, Oklahoma, that influences everything about a, a native person's willingness and interest and ability to pursue health and wellness. That background influences help declining. Why do Native people decline help? Well, not just Native people, anybody. I used to talk about help seeking and then uh, Native health providers told me, actually we see more help declining than we see help seeking. So I've added help declining, and we've done some presentations on help declining, native help declining, why? A lot of this trust, <clears throat> um, help seeking, how native people seek help and who they seek help from, um, what they disclose or, or not, uh, how native people respond to different treatment approaches uh, and how they use recovery resources. So, we're all on the path of trying to find the best combination of supports to help our native people in our community or in our families become healthier if they're not healthy already. 
So I want to share with you on the next slide some ideas, uh, some examples of native brilliance. There's probably a, every table here probably has examples of native brilliance. Probably you yourself, but your experiences, you have your own ex examples of native brilliance and positive support examples. So I'm going to share two with you in the next slide. One is the We Matter campaign, which is one of my favorite groups because it was developed by young people, young native people. <clears throat> and the second one is the, it used to be called Ask Anti, and they changed it, which I love the way they changed Broadman to Ask Your Relatives. And that's our friends at the Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board who do phenomenal work on, um, and have incredible resources on their website for native addiction treatment and native emotional support. So I'm going to start with the We Matter campaign on the, on the next slide. So the We Matter campaign, a brother and a native brother and a native sister. And they were seeing losing friends to suicide. And they decided they were going to do something about it. They didn't have an organization. They said, we don't need no stinking organization. We don't need um, to partner with a facility. We're young, we're native, we're intelligent, and we have we know technology. So they decided, they started this campaign called "I Matter, You Matter, We Matter," and they use cell phones. So they started this cell phone campaign, uh, primarily focused on preventing native youth uh, suicide. And what they were trying to do is they were trying to reach the young native person that's sitting alone in their bedroom or wherever they are at at three in the morning and are incredibly sad and feeling there's no like there's no hope. That's sort of who they were trying to reach. So they started this campaign using cell phones. And what it was is anyone can make could film themselves with their cell phone. And, lead, and create a one, two, or three minute message of hope and comfort. Um, and they have hundreds of them. It spread like wildfire all over Canada. I'm gonna share some of those examples with you in a second here. So they have their website that you can go on to and look at what they have. And you'll see all these little videos of native people and they're all telling of giving a message of hope. So the next slide is, um, they say that We Matter is a place to help indigenous youth get through hard times, whether you need your support yourself or you want to support someone you know. So then the next slide, I think we're gonna actually, if we can do this magic. We're gonna listen to, a, it's only like a, less than two minute video of Kev, Kelvin Redvers, the co-founder, the brother, there's a brother and a sister. And he talks about the We Matter campaign. The magic of technology here. I've had the chance to meet both Kelvin and his sister more than once. And we actually filmed this little video short with Kelvin. Let's see if we can get it to play for you. No, oh, it's not gonna play. Okay, <clears throat> so Kelvin says in the video, and he's a really cool young guy in his twenties. And he says, this reason why they did it. He just says, you know, we decided to do this and we don't, we didn't need any, we, we have, we're young and we're smart. That's all we, and we have cell phones. So they just said, why not? We can do it. And that's basically what he says in the video. The next one I wanna show you, and I'm not sure if it's gonna play or not, 
No. Oh, the next one is uh, Melanie Mark. No, I guess it, I guess they won't play. Well, you all will be able to get on them and play them yourselves if you go to the website. They're all short. They're only one, two, or three minutes. But um, Melanie Mark is uh, one of the first um, one of the first First Nation people elected to the Canadian Legislature, and she tells a story about what it was like for her growing up um, as a Native person. And she had she says she had an alcoholic mother and. You know, she really had a tough life. Uh, she attempted suicide herself when she was young and her auntie reached out and saved her. And she just gives, uh, uh, tells the young people that are listening to her. She's saying that don't give up, that you're an intelligent person. And um, like, you know, the same thing happened to me. And look at me now, I'm an elected official. But it's a really cool message. But if you go on their website, oops, if you go on their website, <laughs> sorry, uh, I think she's on the first page when it opens up, so you, you can listen to it. But I'd encourage you all to look at the We Matter campaign. Um, so, because it's very joyous. So, the next thing is the Northwest Portland Area and Health Board. We're just going to move on. Sorry, you couldn't see those two videos. Um, so these, my friends over at Northwest Portland Air and Indian Health Board really do awesome work. <clears throat> um, and you know, they, they're, they, their member nations are, uh, Washington, Oregon, and Idaho. And this woman here is from Warm Springs, which is a wonderful area. It's a confederation of tribes. And I love the way that she's dressed. You know, there's a really cool picture of, um, you know, back in the ancient days before there were, there were only native people. And the Columbia River is a gigantic river, if you've ever been there. And then here comes, here comes Lewis and Clark, right? Uh, and that back in those days, there's a place um, not too far, it's about maybe 20 minutes east of Portland, Oregon on the Columbia River. And it's called Salilo Falls. And Salilo Falls was this big fishing area for tribes. And there were literally waterfalls there and then they built the dams. So further up river, they built all the big dams. And there's this really sad, but poignant picture, uh, photo, black and white photograph of these three Indian women standing there and they all had buckskin dresses on it. It's the back of them. And they're watching the, the damming up of the waterfalls. They're watching their traditional fishing area fill it with water uh, and to be no more. But uh, the Salado Falls area was a big gathering place for tribes. They say as far as Mexico and everywhere, tribes from all over would come there because it was a trade place. And they, but the, all the different tribes spoke different languages. So they created a trade language called Chinook and, and all, I can imagine what it was like. It must've been really joyous to be all these different tribes there, everybody excited, trading. Um, <clears throat> but once they flooded the, their traditional fishing, they still have houses there. <clears throat> uh, so there's still a Salido Falls community and those tribal people still live there. They just got new houses not too long ago, actually. It's just a little bitty place. There's probably maybe 10 houses, but they've always kept to the, those tribes, those river tribes, They've always kept their same traditional fishing grounds, uh, flooded or not, but they're still there. And this lady is from Warm Springs. Uh, so I just wanna share that picture. Her. Um, so the next thing I'm trying to show you is, this is a screenshot of the 
Ask Your Relatives website. So when they first started, it was called Ask Your Auntie. So they had a native woman, an auntie, and that anybody could send a message to her, young people normally, and they would say, well, what is this I hear about fentanyl or what, you know, whatever they wanted to ask, they would ask their auntie. And then the Portland Area Health Board had a group of professionals behind the scene, uh, physicians and other people who would work on creating the response. And then the auntie would send the message back and they, they published it on their website. So they have the question and the answer. Well, they expanded it now to ask your relatives. So they added a man, which is awesome. So take a, take a look when you get a chance, if you haven't seen their uh, We Are Native, uh, Ask Your Relatives uh, link on their website. And I think you have the information there. So I wanna share that with you. Then the last thing I wanna go through really quickly is what our response has been to all of this information that we've gathered and the concern about substance use and the partnership that was developed. So if we can go to the next slide. I need to hurry through this real quick. So the next slide is, that's another New York example, but then the next slide is the Reclaiming series. So we started the Reclaiming Native Psychological Brilliance in January of this year. And then we're just gonna go through the months here real quick, to show you what it is. So in January, should just say January 25th, not a, that was the introduction and I did that. And you can see we had 304 people that registered for it that first month. And then after the, it's over, people who couldn't attend, they watched the video. 281 people watched the video. And then the next month in February, was we focused on young people and we had two fabulous young people that you can see there. We had 412 people registered that month for it, which is enormous. And then in March, we did with a native psychologist, tribal psychologist, Jeff King, did this really cool history of native influence on modern psychology. Uh, all of these you can see, they're all just one hour long. And we show native videos at the beginning and end of each of them, of song, dance, spoken word. The last uh, April was um, two of my favorite people, Art Martinez and Mike Duncan, um, talked about native help seeking from a male perspective, help declining and help seeking. Mike Duncan's the founder of the Native Dads Network, which is something really super cool, uh, mobilizing men. And they had 430 people registered. So you can see every month we get hundreds of people around the country. Uh, and they was Dr. Dolores Bigfoot uh, talking about trauma and post-traumatic growth with her colleague, Susan Schmidt. June was um, Jeff King again and uh, Danica Brown from Portland talking about the sacred trust of assessment and diagnosis through an indigenous lens. July was substance use and hungry ghosts with uh, a TED talk of Dr. Mate. And then we had the pleasure of having Don Coyas, our friend, uh, was commentator during that day. And he was fabulous. This month, it's going to be Kateri Coyas, uh, Don Coyas's daughter, who's now the executive director, the next generation filling the boots of white bison. In September, we're gonna talk about native life transformation. Uh, resource, strength-based resources and relapse and crisis prevention. We're going to talk about the 988 rollout, the tribal rollout of 988. Um, that's in September. October, we have our good friend, Grovant tribal psychologist, uh, Joe Gon, who's um, at Harvard University now, and he's really incredibly fabulous. He's going to talk about reframing native mental health. In November, we're going to do a year interview. So I wanted to close with this a video, but I don't think we're, I don't think the videos are working. Oh, okay. Here's another one. When you get this PowerPoint, click on this video. <clears throat> this is um, Kelvin Redford's sister, the brother sister that started We Matter, Tunshai Redvers, and she does this. She is an artist and a poet, and she has this poem that she reads and then 
the words are on the screen. It's only two minutes long, but it is the most incredibly powerful two minutes you'll encounter in a week, maybe a month, maybe a year. Um, so I'm sorry we can't show it to you, but um, you all can look at it yourself. And I think that's it. I just want to close with my uh, contact information if people have questions. Um, echohawk at pacifier.com. And those are the three places that I, that I work at. But thank you so much for listening to this and um, hope you got some good ideas. And, uh, and thank you for being brilliant in your work. Roll down. Thanks. So, Holly Echohawk, thank you so much for your valued session that we have. Um, we want here at you said we want to present you with this um, token of our appreciation. So thank you so much. And if you don't mind, please fill out the surveys that were just handed to you. Thank you. Just some brief housekeeping. I know we are in our break time and we will honor that and move on to our sessions in your agenda book at the top tab, there's color coded areas to indicate which room each session will be in. It took me a minute to figure that out. I was like, the assignments aren't in there, but they are there. And just look at the um, color codes matching with the sessions that are listed. And I do want to also mention that the diabetes coordinators meeting, which is open to everyone will be held in this room as well. So this is break time. Thank you again to Ms. Holly Echohawk. Another round of applause for her for sharing her native brilliance with us. So thank you. Take a quick break and we will immediately move into our breakout sessions. Thank you.